All right, uh, welcome to the first of two um, courses on, on the Eastern Front that I'm going to be doing here uh, for the Beyond the Western Front um, course series uh, for the Great War Group. Um, we've divided it up uh, from 1914 to 1915, which we're going to do today, and then the next time it's going to be 1916 to 1917, uh, 18, something like that. Um, this one is going to be very heavy on, on military actions uh, because so much happens in the first two years. Well, next time we have a little more time to look at, at some other aspects of, of the Eastern Front that I think is important to mention um, generally uh, because we're, we're doing an entire front, which I'm going to claim is as important or as big as the Western Front, but only in two times where the last course series you had a whole course series on the Western Front. There are many things that we can't do, uh, so I've picked some things, but I will try to mention as many things as possible so that you can also um, just make a note. And if it sounds interesting, go back and look at, at it at, at another time on your own, if, if, if you fancy. Hopefully, uh, we'll get through this. As uh, Alex said, I have about 100 slides. Some of them are very short, but uh, we're going to crack through it. So, um, and uh, yeah, if there's something I don't understand, you don't understand or, or or something, just uh, ask in the end because, uh, well, there's some language thing for me sometimes, and uh, hopefully it won't bother you. But uh, let's start. And the first thing I want to talk about is this thing, this concept of uh, a forgotten front um, or sideshow of main front. Uh, as you can see, I have some quotes up. Uh, it's not always that I will actually read the quotes of what's written along the way because we don't have the time for it. So it's a little up for you to, to also follow along. Uh, but I think this one is important to note that the historian Jay Winter says that the 10 million men uh, who fought in the First World War on the Eastern Front is the largest group of unknown soldiers in the 20th century. And I think this is an important thing to note. I mean, you've all, um, well, I don't know if you have, but uh, this was a book that um, I picked for you to, to read. Uh, and that is the, what I think is the, the most up-to-date uh, overall history of, of the Eastern Front, even though the, it is the, the Russian army in the Eastern Front that is in, in center. The, the Eastern Front has been uh, pretty much the forgotten front since the end of the war. Even during the war, um, people didn't think much of it uh, as opposed to the, to the Western Front. And it was even quickly forgotten on the uh, on the Eastern Front or, or on the, amongst the, the countries and the nations that fought on the Eastern Front. The first time you have it is in the 30s. You have Churchill who writes uh, his, his book uh, called, called The Unknown uh, Front, um, which for some reason I couldn't find to show you. But, but, but that is the first um, major contribution to the literature on the Eastern Front in English. Then it takes a long time until the 70s when Norman Stone uh, writes his book, The Eastern Front, and it's a good book still. It's a bit dated, and he has this weird thing where he says that everything stopped in 1917, when it definitely didn't. Uh, but whatever happened, maybe he ran out of characters. Uh, what, <laughs> we, we don't know. But it's a good book, and it, it really uh, brought some attention to the Eastern Front at, at this point. But it was not something that really stayed a long time. Then in the 80s, um, you had this one by uh, W. Uh, Bruce Lincoln, who wrote a uh, passage through Armageddon, which is part two of a three-part series of uh, of the, the Russians. The first one is before the First World War, the Russo-Japanese War, the the, the uh, 1905 revolution. Second one is is the Western Front. Uh, sorry, the uh, <laughs> yeah the the Eastern Front um, and Russia in the First World War, and then you have the last one, which is the Civil War. Uh, that was the next step, and then you have the book that I chose for you to read. Um, this one by, by David Stone, who very much tried to, to tell the same story as Norman Stone did, uh, but did do it up to date and try to include much more of, of the story. Um, so that's a little bit about why we talk about this as a, as a forgotten front. Today, you can say, why, why do we not, why is it so hard to write these books? And I, I think that there's a lot of things when it comes to the language, there's a lot of things when it comes to who is fighting it. Uh, the countries that were involved are not always that interested in remembering this part of, of, of their own history. Uh, and then, of course, we don't have 
that much still uh, fam familiarity with the geography, with the place names. You're going to hear a lot of weird place names that you, of places you don't, you never knew existed. Um, but it's also important to remember that back then it was much different. That, that some of these things to the people who fought there meant a lot that it doesn't today. So even though something sounds strange now, it wasn't a hundred mm -hmm. uh, some years ago. Then I want to talk a bit about this rethinking of the, the forgotten front, if you will. Um, I think it's important. This are some points that I will make. You can agree with them. You cannot. Uh, you can disagree with them. But I think these are these are some important points to make. That the First World War began because of events in the East, and the war in the West was in many ways a consequence of what happened in the East. That's why it is a very important part of the war. Then it's important to remember that everything that happened in the East had consequences in the West, and everything that happened in the West has consequences in the East, much more than any other front. These two are going to work together because it's on the, on the opposite side of Germany, which is in the middle as the link between these two fronts uh, in many ways. So when something happens in the East, it has a, an effect in the West and the same way. So, so Understanding the Eastern Front also gives a better understanding of the Western Front, which gives a better understanding of the war as a whole. Then I want to challenge this uh, notion of the East as being less bloody, more docile than, um, than the Western Front. Uh, because sometimes the Eastern Front completely dwarfed anything that ever happened uh, in the West. It is true that there are periods, which we'll see, where this pretty much nothing is happening. But then there are other times, which is basically the whole time we're going to be talking here is the, the Eastern Front is full on and, and at a much higher level in intensity uh, at points than, than anything that will ever be seen on the, um, on the Western Front, even during the big offensives. These are, this is a massive front and it's not standing still for very long, except for two periods, which we'll get to. Um, and then it is uh, important that for significant periods of the war, the war in the East was the center of attention from the majority of the belligerents. I know this sounds strange, but as we'll see, the Eastern Front becomes the center of attention at, in the first uh, two years of the war um, during specific times when, when all uh, the attention of, of several big powers are all concentrated on the East. Then it's to, important to remember that for millions of people who fight in the war, if you remember before uh, J.A. Winters uh, uh, quote about uh, the 10 million people, that for millions of people, the Eastern Front is the main front. There is no Western Front if, if you are an Austrian soldier, if you are a Hungarian soldier, if you are a, um, if you're a Russian soldier. This is, it's, it's not a, a, a thing for them in the same way. And the main front is what we call the Eastern Front today. So, and the last point I want to make is that in some ways, the war in the East was a more decisive war than what was fought in the West. And I'll get to that because that sounds a bit strange, but I think we will get to that more in the next part. But this is a way I think we should start rethinking um, the Eastern Front. Now, before we, we, we start uh, talking about the war, I want to just quickly run through the, the three main belligerents that we have. We have the Russian army first, which is this, huge army uh, in the east and uh, that is going to be the, the the main entente army um in in, in the in the east until and, and the only one for that matter until uh, romania joins in 1916. now the russian army is um has some so has had a a rough start to the to the to the um to the 20th century in 1905 uh, they're beaten in uh, in in uh, in, uh, in the east against um, Japan, and a revolution breaks out. So the the Russian army is completely uh, uh, torn apart in this war. There's a lot of political turmoil. Uh, the Tsar loses some of his his uh, his power, but there's also an important point to remember that the the, the Russian army that survives is much. Uh, is, is, is the army that has fought a major conflict of modern war um, of all the armies that will be fighting in the East. They are the ones who have the, the greatest experience in modern warfare. And they're going to spend the time after, uh, from 1905 until the, the First World War, um, 
going uh, through this experience and, and coming up with things. And they're going to take some lessons from that. Some of them are going to be right. Some of them are going to be wrong. But they do have some experience drawn. Then it's important to remember that this is a, a huge army, and it is essentially a SARS army. It means that everybody responds to the SAR, not so much the country. It is also an army that is very uh, hier hierarchical. Uh, the, the, um, the officers uh, are completely separate from the men, and they are mostly uh, of uh, aristocracy. It's hard to climb for peasant from the bottom to, to higher levels. Um, but it's a huge army, and one of the things that uh, that you're going to hear is this this uh, idea of the steamroller. This is the fear that the Russian army can put into uh, Germany and Austria. This idea that once the Russian army has mobilized, it's going to be so big, so huge, that there's nothing you can do about it. You're just going to be steamrolled, as you can see here. Uh, the Austrian emperor is running away from from the Russian steamroller. Um, and let's talk about the um, the uh, the leadership. You have the Tsar uh, as the head of the country, and the army responds directly to him. But he's not immediately going to be the supreme commander of the army. He's going to leave that to the man next to him, his uncle, uh, Grand Duke Nikolai. Um, great name. He's a tall man. He's uh, he's known for being uh, aggressive, and he's a, a military man. He's not always uh, the most decisive, and he has some issues with. Um, uh, being put under pressure, he sometimes wavers, but he's generally going to be doing a, a decent job to begin with, unlike the chief of the general staff, um, Janusz Kiewicz, who's pretty much uh, considered an incompetent man, but who is, who's been put in this position uh, because of, of, uh, of connections, and he is uh, also going to have and, and the, sorry, the Russians are also going to deal with this guy, Samsonov, who is the uh, Minister of War, who there, there's a bit of, of, of a, a, a discussion today because for a long time he was seen as this just corrupt man who didn't do anything good. Now everybody agrees he's, he was still a super corrupt man, but he also did a lot uh, to, to, to uh, improve the army after the Russian Japanese war towards uh, the, uh, the outbreak of the First World War. I was very brief on the um, Russian army. Then you have the Austro Hungarian army, who is in the beginning going to be the second biggest army on, on the Eastern Front. And um, this is this army that is very much a reflection of this multinational uh, empire of Austria and Hungary, which is in, divided in two parts. They have an army that is split uh, in, in different parts. They have a common army for the whole country. They have a national army called the Hundred for the Hungarian part. They have a Landwehr army, the national army from the Austrian part. Then they have a small home guard uh, for, from uh, Croatia. So they have a lot of split things and they have a lot of um, lots to deal with when it, when it comes to, to uh, uh, yeah, uh, conflicts within in the army between different uh, nationalities. And they also have the language problem. This is a postcard uh, that they started issuing in 1916, but it served the purpose even though we're only in 14 now to show this is... Uh, 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 an army with uh, with eleven official languages. Here we have a, 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 a postcard that just has the same line written all over it that I'm healthy and I'm well. And then you can just underline the one that uh, that uh, is in the language that you speak and send it home and, and nothing else. Uh, but there is going to be issues with this. It is not an issue in the beginning of the war as much as it is later on, because in peacetime all Aust Austrian officers were required to learn the language of the men they commanded. This was difficult sometimes because some uh, regiments could have uh, four or five different languages and the officer was required to learn it. And if he didn't speak any of them to begin with, well, he was in trouble. Uh, but generally it was a system that worked okay in peacetime. In wartime, when officers started dying and you need new officers, it's gonna completely break down because you have to push out uh, officers as fast as you can to replace the ones who die. Uh, or are too wounded to continue, um, and they're not going to be able to do this, meaning that a lot of officers in the Austro-Hungarian army cannot communicate with their soldiers after a very short time. There is also an army that is a result of complete and utter um, political conflict. The Austrian and Hungarian uh, parts of the empire is, is, um, is very separate. There, there is uh, 
the, everything has to be agreed on in both parliaments, in the Hungarian parliament and in the Austrian parliament. And uh, one of the things that the Hungarians are worried about is this idea of that the common army is the Austrian army, not so much the Hungarian army. And they only want to fund it uh, if they can get um, money for their own hundred army, their own national army, meaning that the Austrian army goes into the war having to almost no uh, budget um, extensions over the last 50 years or so. Uh, the army is going to be very small. They're not going to have many trained reserves. They're going to have old guns uh, made with bronze barrels because steel was too, too expensive. Uh, and they're just going to be at a significant disadvantage to begin with, uh, and especially when casualties starts to, to rig up. The head of the, the, the country uh, is uh, this guy, he's the emperor, uh, Franz Joseph I. Uh, he's an old man, he's in his 80s when the war began, um, uh, and he is not going to be able to take command of the army at that point. So, from a dynastic point of view, this is Archduke Friedrich, who becomes the supreme commander of the army. Uh, you might not have heard of him before because he's not very well known, because he, he saw his own role, even though he was quite competent at, at some point. He saw his role as being, okay, I'm only the head because I'm in this uh, Habsburg family, so I'm going to leave it all to my chief of staff, which is the man you might know. Um, this is uh, Franz Konrad von Hützendorf, who becomes the, the uh, Austrian uh, chief of the general staff in 1905, and he is a man who loves to declare war. He really, really wants to go to war, and he, he constantly uh, asked to be able to go to war in the beginning, uh, but but he is denied until, of course, the um, the uh, the archduke and his wife is killed in Sarajevo, and he finally can go to war. He's also a man who believes in the offensive. He believes that that is the only way to win a war. Uh, he is a man who is completely careless about his his uh, his soldiers as long as he can go on the offensive to win a battle. And he is also a man who thinks that that his army should be completely independent, not much co cooperation with the Germans. He wants to be in control, and he wants his uh, his uh, victories to be very much Austrian victories. As we can, we'll see, that's going to be an issue. Then you have the German army. We're going to go a little faster between this uh, uh, through this to begin with. It's a very professional army. Uh, it has good officers, uh, good training, good troops, uh, and it's probably the best trained of the armies uh, to fight on the Eastern Front in the beginning. They're also an army that sees themselves as being uh, superior to the enemy that they're going to fight. Uh, also, the Russians, as you can see here, carrying the other uh, alliance partners of the Entente. And they are very influenced by this man, who is uh, Schlieffen, who you've heard of before, especially if you were in the, in the last uh, course series. He's the man who has come up with the, the uh, plan of attack, and we're going to look at that as well. We have the emperor, uh, head of the, um, uh, of the state. You have Molke, who is going to be the, the uh, German chief of staff to begin with. Uh, but that's for all of the war, and this Schlieffen plan is very much designed to split up the army, and the man in charge of the war in the East to begin with is this man, Max von Prittwitz, who is uh, the commander of the Eighth Army uh, and in charge of the defense of East Prussia. Um, we'll see how it goes with him in a minute. So this is the map that I'm going to be trying to use uh, throughout this series um, of the Eastern Front. You can see the border running through uh, as a, the, the, the gray line, uh, showing that there is this, this huge um, uh, salient in the middle with this with the Russian part of Poland, uh, and then a division in the south uh, between, uh, you can see where it says Hungary, that's where the line between Germany and Austria runs. So let's look at the war plans. Germany, as I said before, you have uh, Prithwitz, 8th Army, and then I've chucked in um, this uh, little extra photo of uh, General Francois, who is uh, the commander of the 1st Corps, because he's going to play an important role. They're basically going to go on a holding uh, operation in the east, while, uh, according to the Schlieffen plan, the German army beats France before turning east to beat the Russians, before the Russians are done mobilizing. That's the plan. Then there's Conrad's plan. Conrad is, is uh, 
thinking that that there is an idea in he, he really wants there to be a coordinated offense so that the eighth army goes on the offense and he can go on the offense from um from what is essentially galicia which is where the the blue arrow, arrow starts uh but it's not going to be like that as as we know because the eighth army is just going to hold uh, and he will be left to launch an offensive of his own now conrad has six armies at his disposal, and uh, he's going to launch an offensive with the first and the fourth uh, into Poland and hold their flank with the third. And you can see the second army is, uh, is striked out. That is because in the beginning of the war, Conrad decides to only mobilize against um, Serbia, not mobilizing against Russia, which means sending three armies south to Serbia. Now, it very quickly becomes clear that the Russians are going to be in this fight as well, which means that Conrad has to very quickly move that ex an extra army from the south to the east to be able to have enough men to beat the Russians in the east. And what happens is that he doesn't have the rail capacity to do that, meaning he has to send the first, fourth, and third army to Galicia first before he can start moving the second army, meaning that everything that is going to happen in the east is going to happen as the, the second army arrives which means in the end that the second army is basically only going to, going to arrive in Galicia to take part in a big military defeat that we'll see in a minute. <clears throat> now the Russians, they have the opportunity to strike out of the Polish salient directly at Berlin. But of course, as you can probably already see, there is the danger of uh, being cut off from the, the, the south by the Austrians and from the north by the Germans that is not going to be a very very good option which means that that the, the polish area is going to be almost completely there's almost going to be no troops of any kind in all that area where you see the two uh, arrows from from um, from the, the austrians and germans it's going to be only a few guard troops on both sides defending because nobody thinks that anything is going to happen there in the beginning the russians divide their front into a, a northern front, no, northwestern front, and a southwestern front. Um, northern front is going to be commanded by Zielinski, who is also a not very competent general, and a much more competent general in South Ivanov, um, who is going to take care of these, uh, the, um, the Austrians. Now, they, are, of course, have the, the opportunity to either strike hard against uh, the, uh, the Germans or against the Austrians. And what they're going to do is they're going to send two armies against uh, Germany and four armies against Austria, which means that the main strike is going to go against Conrad, who is not ready with his forces because the second army is still on the move. Now, the first real uh, struggle on the Eastern Front happens in East Prussia with the first and second uh, Russian armies. We're going to march into East Prussia to try and push the Germans back from there and eliminate one of the flanks, which will open up the possibility of then launching this offensive from the Polish salient into, um, into uh, Germany against Berlin. And I hope you read it. Uh, as I said, you have to read some of these your, yourself. I'm just going to leave it, but you're not going to miss out if you don't read them. It's just uh, as, as some small quotes to, to give some, to set some mood. Um, this is the battlefield that we will, we're going to be looking at for East Prussia in August 1914. Now, as you can see, you have uh, in black, you have the, um, it's supposed to say the eighth. Uh, that is a mistake. It was supposed to say the Eighth Army, not the First. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but that is uh, Pritvitz's forces. And then you have the First Army from uh, moving from the east. That is commanded by Rennenkampf, the guy with the impressive mustache. And then you have the Second Army from the south, commanded by Samsonov. And then you have the Germans. They're deploying three corps to the, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the east and one corps to the south. The First clash happens on the 17th of August at uh, Stalopernen, uh, when, contrary to, to uh, Pritvitz's orders, this guy, Francois, who is the commander of First Corps, makes an attack at the, the Russian First Army. And it, it's uh, going to go all right, but he's still going to be pushed back. Still, he's going to convince Pritvitz that they need to take an offensive action. And that 
happens on the 20th when Pritvis uh, allows for three corps, the first, uh, the uh, uh, 17th, and the first reserve corps, and the, the, I've put another man up there now, he is uh, General Van Mackensen, who's going to play an important role at, later on, that's why he's here as well, are going to attack here at Gumbinen. Now, first corps is going to do relatively well at Gumbinen, but Mackensen's corps is not going to do well. They're going to completely walk into uh, a very bad situation, going to be slaughtered by Russian fire and, and artillery. And first uh, reserve corps is not really going to be there to help them, which means that Pritvitz's three corps are forced to push, pull back and first army can move forward into East Prussia. Now, at this point, Pritvitz panics. He, he has a complete break of will and he informs Molke, the uh, German general, uh, in the chief of the general staff, that he intends to retreat to the Vistula and basically give up East Prussia. And Molke is very much not happy about this. So he sends for these two. And I've completely stolen this term from another historian, the Grusen Tusen. Uh, this is uh, Paul von Hindenburg on the left and um, Eric von Ludendorff on the right. And what this is basically is you, you're pulling in an old man who's going to be the head of the army, Hindenburg, and pairing him with the one you really actually want there, Ludendorff, who's done very well in Belgium at the time, but doesn't really have the, the status of a, an army commander and, and, and somebody who's going to do that. He's not very well liked by the emperor, for example, and he is not a very likable man in general. Um, but they're going to turn out to be a wonderful pair, uh, and they are going to be, as Paul uh, Hindenburg will describe, happy marriage. Uh, and as you can see by this quote, if you, if you have a chance to read it, that it is very clear that uh, Hindenburg was well aware of this arrangement, that it was very much Ludendorff who, who was the, the brains behind it. Well, he also offered an authority, he offered some calm and, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and a presence for the soldiers to go on with the fight in East Prussia. Now, what is happening as they arrive from the West um, is, that Renenkampf in the East First Army has made a halt. They're going to stop. They're, they've pushed into East Prussia. And they're going to slow down. And at the same time, Second Army is pushing north. Now, First Army, the Russians, is going to tell Second Army in the, in the south that they have the enemy on the run and that Second Army should just push north and hit them in the flank. Um, Instead of pushing on, Renningkampf is basically going to stop there and just wait and see what happens, which gives uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff the opportunity to move some things around. And they're going to do this. I don't have a photo of him uh, right here, with the help of the, the, the um, uh, with Pritvitz's uh, chief of staff, Max von Hoffmann, um, who has basically already planned this this out. He just needs the, the, the approval to do it. And he's going to set in for a complete uh, remodeling of the front from the point of view of the Germans. So what they're going to do is that they're going to leave one division to sort of screen off the first division and make them think that there is a lot of forces in front of them. They're going to have some artillery and they're going to fire some rounds and they're going to keep them occupied thinking that they're standing in front of this, uh, this, uh, these three corps. While first corps is going to move to Königsberg and use the rails the, the good rail system that the Germans have in this part of the country to move one core all the way around and then send uh, the two other cores down south as second army moves north, thinking that the first army has the Germans on the run, uh, on the run and that the coast is pretty much clear and that he only has a little bit of resistance from the 20th corps in front of him. So second army moves in and pushes against the 20th corps uh, south of Tannenberg, and as 20 corps moves back, these other three corps are able to move in around uh, the flanks of, of Samsonov, and basically what happens, although it's not completely destruction, 
they are able to, to surround Second Army and destroy much of its forces. And the commander, Samsonov, is so distraught by this that he goes into the forest and shoots himself uh, because he loses the army. This allows the, um, the, uh, the Germans to then move everything against First Army, and they're going to fight uh, in September to push them out of East Prussia. Now, at the same time, things are also heating up in Galicia. We're talking about two major battles on the Eastern Front at this point. But while Tannenberg is much more well-known, Galicia oh. is the much bigger uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the two battles that will happen at this point. And what is going to happen is that the Austro-Hungarian army, this, this not very well-prepared army, with a very aggressive leader at the head, Conrad, um, is going to push in to Galicia and they're going to be uh, meeting the full force of the Russians, who, as we saw, are sending four armies against uh, Galicia to, to conquer that. And they're going to clash in a series of massive battles over a giant front of more than 200 kilometers. So the Battle of Galicia will take place here in August and September 1914. And you can see that the big area is pointing north. That's the main direction of Conrad's offensive. The first time that the armies are going to clash is going to happen between um, the first army under Dunkel and this fourth army under General Salsa. Um, and they're going to clash at this small uh, town uh, in, in uh, just on the other side of the border called Krasnik. And it's a, it's a, a Napoleonic style battle. It's a battle with cavalry charges, it's lines of infantry marching against each other. But in the end, it's going to be a, a minor, but, but the first uh, Austrian victory of the war. Second time, a few days later, the fourth army is going to uh, clash with Plevis' fifth army, the fourth army being commanded by Alfenberg, who was also the previous uh, Austrian minister of war. Uh, they're going to clash at Komarov, another small town just on the other side of the border. And again, this is going to turn out to be a very bloody battle, but it's also going to be another Austrian victory. So everything se seems to go very well for the Austrians to begin with. Now, then you have the third army under Rudermann, who is this? He is this rising star within the Austrian uh, command structure. He is, did well in, in, uh, in the War Academy, in the Kriegsschule. Uh, and and he uh, is is one who is very 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 keen to prove himself. But he's been put in charge of the third army, who is basically guarding Lemberg. Lemberg is what they call Lviv uh, in Ukraine, and it is the capital of Galicia, of the province of Galicia, which is what you can see now on the map. And he is then ordered because it seems to be going well. He is ordered to move east um, carefully. Conrad says, go out, do it, but do it carefully. But he is going to push forward as fast as he can. And I've put a big question mark because the cavalry, the Austrian cavalry in this part of the front completely fails to find out who he is marching against. There's no, he has no idea what he's marching against, but he's just pushing as fast as he can directly east. What he doesn't know and what the cavalry fails to find out is that the third army under General Ruski and the Eighth Army under uh, under Brusilov, we are going to hear a lot more about next time. Is forming up the main Russian strike force in Galicia, and he is marching directly into that, and he's going to be outnumbered three to one. Uh, they are going to class at this battle called Schlotchov on the twenty sixth, and completely be annihilated. They are going to pull back uh, to just east of Lemberg on a river called the Knilalipa. And there again, they're going to be beat uh, and pushed back and, and to the point where officers and men are fleeing and running through the streets of Lemberg as fast as they can just to get away as fast as possible. It is a complete and utter failure. And this is where everything starts to go very, very, very wrong for the Austrians in this part of the campaign. So with Third Army moving west as fast as they can, Conrad orders 4th Army under Aufenberg to switch right. They have beat 5th Army before, and now they're going to go, uh, go southeast and form a new line of defense to the west of, of Lemberg 
uh, which falls on the 2nd of September, to try and stop the Russians. Now, we can decide whether or not we want to judge these decisions, but it is, it is very much agreed upon that this is a very bad move because what he's going to do, Conrad, is he's going to set his army up for a fight that he's already lost, but he's going to cling to the idea that he can stop the Russians uh, instead of giving up the fight. So what's happening is that the uh, third army, uh, who's uh, who uh, is now going to be commanded by uh, Borovievich, uh, who will later have a very good career in Italy, he's going to take over from Bruderman, who is quickly retired because of, of his uh, conduct pushing out of Lemberg. Uh, he's going to uh, make a line of defense together with uh, Burm Imoli's second army, which is beginning to arrive at this point. Or the, the, there's enough troops to actually make a defense and fourth army to the north, uh, which is swung around. And this will be what's called the second battle of Lemberg, but it's basically two battles, the battle of Ravaruska and the battle of Brodig to the south, um, which is gonna last for the, from the third to the 11th of September. As they fight against the third and the eighth army, fifth army is gonna, uh, the Russian fifth army is gonna uh, regroup and start pushing south much faster than the Austrians expected meaning that they are marching directly into the flank of uh, the Austro-Hungarian 4th Army. At the same time, to really make the death punch uh, of the Conrad's forces, the Russians are also pulling down the 9th Army under on, on uh, Platon Lichinsky, who is actually the only Russian commander who will be in charge of his army throughout the war. He's a very competent commander. He's going to move in and start pushing into the side of uh, into the left flank of the first army, which means that, that Conrad is left little other choice now with his army in in um, in danger of being completely surrounded, but to pull back to the Carpathians, giving up the entire uh, region of Galicia. It is an absolutely devastating defeat. Conrad is uh, losing a massive amount of men. In about two weeks, he's lost 400,000 men in Galicia. It is incredible numbers. The Russians lose about 200 to 300,000 in two weeks of fighting uh, on the Eastern Front. But the Russians have much more troops to fill the ranks, and they are still in the process of mobilizing at this point and are pulling in more troops. The Austrians have lost the, pretty much the size of their peacetime ar army, and the war is not even a, a month old at this point. Um, so they are pulling back to Galicia, and this is the end of these two big battles in the east. One impressive victory in um, in um, uh, in East Prussia, and one complete defeat in uh, Galicia for the central powers. And while you can say that it is one of uh, one to one, when you look at it. It's one army that, is that, uh, that the Russians have, uh, have, um, have defeated in, in, um, in East Prussia and one that is basically just pushed out again. In the Austrian battle, in the Battle of Galicia, it's four Austro-Hungarian armies that are almost completely destroyed after a few weeks. Now, at this point, uh, this is one of the things that I want to pick up also just to talk about as, as a theme rather than go completely military and action on it. Because while we are well aware of these atrocities that happened in Belgium uh, as the Germans invade, there are also a lot of atrocities happening on the Eastern Front. And these are what I've called the forgotten atrocities of the Eastern Front. There, there's going to be a lot of these, but I've picked three that um, sort of highlight what is going on at this point, because a lot of it will happen in the beginning. The first one is what is known as the destruction of Kalish, also sometimes known as Kalish pogrom. This is a strange event that happens in the very early days of the war. Germany and, and, and Russia are at war from the 1st of August. And already on the 2nd of August, the German troops are going to take this little border, well, little border town. It's a, it's a, it's a town, a town or, city, or city of um, around 70,000 people uh, right on the border. And they're going to move in to, to, to move on the first day of the war. Uh, to, to occupy this, this uh, town in, in Russian Poland. So what happens is that some Russian soldiers have been out drinking 
and they arrive in the night into the city and they just walk through the streets singing and having a good time marching directly into the city not knowing that it has already been occupied by the germans now the germans and russians end up in a firefight but the germans are going to start blaming that this is an attack by uh the civilians that it, it is uh what we in the rest of like frank to us like free shooters uh that have shot at them and they're gonna rain destruction for about uh three weeks uh, on this this town hundreds are going to be killed thousands are going to be displayed there's beatings there's rapes there's hostage takings there's destruction of a large part of the city and as you can see it's a well 65,000 uh people in 1914 by the end of the war there's only going to be about 5,000 people left in this this town so many is going to uh, going to go and as you can see on this one it's also going to serve as a propaganda victory for the for the Russians. In 1916, even the Germans look back at this and admit that they have completely overreacted. But much of the same things that we see in the West, this this fear of of going into to, to war for the first time, uh, being shot at, uh, inexperience, uh, being amongst a lot of civilians, not knowing what's going on, uh, misunderstandings, and also just of course, uh, like like a normal like a blood rush when 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 it it starts going off, it's going to attribute to this. And uh, as you can see, it's completely going to ruin this town. Uh, and as uh, as I've written here in the in the notes, the destruction of of this town is accounts for thirty percent of all destruction in Russian Poland during the entire war. So it, it's a massive event that get very little attention in the West, but it it is a big. Uh, part of the story of the atrocities in the east now another one that is completely on another scale is the killings that happen in galicia on the at the hands of the austro hungarians there is a lot of suspected um russophilia in in the austro hungarian empire amongst the uh by by the uh, ruling classes of the austrians and the and the hungarians uh and they're going to suspect that all these slavs which make up more than half of the country, um, are, are somehow uh, happy to 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 help the Russians, and they're going to be uh, beginning out harsh punishments, beatings, executions, arrests on this a lot of civilians in the the um, in the uh, in the war zone. It is going to be uh, an ongoing theme, and it's going to to uh to result in these uh, accusations of treason and spying coverings that intensifies as the Habsburg military uh have some setbacks in the war which as we've seen has already happened to begin with <coughs> sorry um there's going to be uh, this blame that oh it's because we the, the civilian population is helping the russians and uh <coughs> sorry there is going to be a lot of of very harsh punishments. As you can see here, maybe as many as 25,000 to 30,000 civilians are going to be killed in Galicia at the hands of the Austro-Hungarians. It doesn't stop in, um, in, in, in Galicia uh, uh, after the very first few months of the war. It's going to continue and as the front moves back and forward over the, the pre-war border, it's going to happen again and again, again, and again. Uh, at some point, the uh, Austrians have to put out a special call for hangmen for the army because they simply do have it, not have enough people to carry out death sentences for the civilian population. Then the last one we're going to look at is the occupation of East Prussia, which uh, will be the one that has the biggest effect. Now, there are two Russian occupations, one from August to September. This is the... Uh, uh, when when Renikov's first army moves into East Prussia, occupies the edge of it, and then again, uh, a few months later, they're going to try again after they're pushed out by the by, by the Germans uh, in September, and they're going to occupy small part but still a part of it from uh, from November 14 to February 1915 when they again push, pushed out in the Second Battle of the Masurian. Um and this is really going to be uh, an important part in. Germany's uh, propaganda machine and in their, their uh, storytelling of why they're fighting the war. 
it, it is not on the same scale as uh, some of these other ones. It's about, these are all estimates. Some of them were made during the war, some of them were done after, all by the Germans, but historians have come to sort of an agreement of what it, it, it seems to have been. And about 1,500 killed, 30,000 uh, deported, of which a third died, three to 400 women raped. But then the major part is, there's going to be 100,000 buildings and houses destroyed and 800,000 people displaced, which are going to move into the rest of Germany, spread out all over. They're going to go to Schleswig, they're going to go to Hamburg, they're going to go to many parts of the country, to Saxony, and they're going to tell story of what is happening when the Russians come knocking. Uh, and it's a story of the bloodthirsty barbarians of the East, of the Cossacks who are going to come in uh, and 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 rape your women and kill you and nail the priest to the church door and all the stories that you're also hearing about in the West from from the Germans on in the, in Belgium, the exact same thing is happening in Germany just with the Russians. But this poster you see of Remember Belgium, you've all, all seen it. I think the green poster with a uh, silhouette of a, a, a German uh, dragging away a woman by their hair or something. Uh, it's the exact same thing is happening in Germany at same time just with the Russians. It's going to rally the German population to fight out this war and to go into a total war later on as well. Also, all the way into Second World War. But this idea of the Russians as coming as barbarians to rape and pillage and kill is going to be taken up again in the Second World War by the Nazis. That is a little bit about this uh, aspect of the war. I will recommend this book called The Whole Empire Walking by Peter Cottrell. And it is, um, uh, sorry, Gattrell. Uh, it is uh, a very, very good book on the whole displacement uh, on, on the refugee situations in the East. Because remember the, the refugee situation, which I'm not gonna be able to cover here in this time, is also huge in this part of the, the, of, of, uh, of the war. Because the front moves so much across uh, the territory, you're going to have a lot of displacement of civilians, and it's going to have consequences. In, in Austria, for example, you have a lot of, of uh, Jews from the East moving into uh, to Vienna, to, to the big cities in, in the West, people who come from, from, uh, from uh, Galicia, which has a very large Jewish population. And they are not going to be very welcome because they come there. They need a, they need medical team. They need food. They need all this. And there's going to be a lot of anti-Semitism forming on the back uh, of this uh, this displacement of people and and of of a lot of Jewish people moving from the eastern regions into the western regions, which is going to also have an effect in the in the next war and what happens then. Now let's move on. Uh, we have. Just to, to, to sum up what's happening and to talk a little bit about what's happening at this point in the war. You have the Russians pushing the Austrians back to the Capetians. Um, and then you have the Germans uh, who, in the first battle of the Missourians in, in uh, September, managed to push Brandenkamp out of East Prussia for the first time. He's going to come back later on. Uh, and then you have, as you can see, two uh, black boxes because at this point, it's not only going to be the Eighth Army in the east of Germany. They are very quickly realizing that, that, that with uh, Russia having beaten Austria, they are going to need to have more troops in the east, moving more troops from the west to the east. Uh, and they're going to move in the Ninth Army um, to, to, uh, to shore up the front. Um, now, the Austrians, as they pull back to the Carpathians, are going to leave a sizable uh, garrison in the city of Chemish, which is a fortress on the River San. Uh, it's about 130,000 soldiers they're going to leave here to, to hold up the Russians as they retreat um, to the Carpathians, and in a hope that the Russians will either uh, be, uh, waste time taking the city or that they would move past it, and then this force can move out and disrupt the rear of the Russian advance. But it's going to have enormous con consequences later on, as we will see in 1915. Now, with this uh, first stage of the war done, all everything is going to concentrate on this part of the front, the Polish salient. 
uh, and that is where the rest of the fighting is going to happen for the rest of 1914. Uh, I cannot go through all the battles because there are a lot of them. So we're going to do it like this. We have, in September and October, we have an attempt to push onto the Vistula and cut off Warsaw by the Germans and Austrians. It's going to go well at first, but then the Germans um, get greedy and try to actually move directly toward Warsaw, which means that the Austrians have to divert from their objective and cover the, Rus uh, the German flank, but the Germans are gonna mo move directly into a huge force that is assembling in Warsaw and be beaten there. So it's gonna be a Russian victory. At the same time, the, Ger the Austrians are pushing on to try to relieve um, Chemis and the, and the garrison there. Uh, and they're gonna manage to do that, but it is not gonna go well because when the Germans pull back from Warsaw and the Vistula, um, the Austrians will have to pull back as well, again, leaving a sizable uh, garrison of about 100,000 people in in, in uh, Chemish. And if you want to read more about the siege, this book, Relatively New by Alexander Watson, The Fortress, is the one to read. Uh, mm -hmm. if you can always ask me for more book suggestions afterwards, uh, or if you miss some of them, but that is the one to read on that. Then you have... Uh, and a very important battle and a very dramatic battle uh, at the Battle of Lotz in November and December, when pretty much what happens is that both sides try to make an offensive, they clash, and it becomes a German strategic victory in the sense that they take the city of Lotz, but it is not a very um, big victory after that. But it's, it's, a victory, uh, it's a battle where both sides are very much on the brink of, of beating the others. It's a very close call, but in the end, it's sort of not much comes of it, except for a little bit. Oh, I went back there, sorry about that. And then in December, you have a Russian attempt uh, at attacking Krakow. It turns out to be an Austrian victory as they push out and manage to strike the Russian force in the flank. So a lot of action, a lot of death, a lot of destruction, but essentially not much of a change of, um, of the front in general. Then we move into 1915. Uh, I can already see that we're running out of time, but yeah, uh, we're just going to do it. So um, at the at the beginning of 1915, Chemis becomes in, comes into focus. This besieged fortress behind Russian lines. <clears throat> Conrad is going to do everything that he can. You can see the, the guy on the left is the General Kuzmanik, who is the uh, the garrison commander. And he is going to say to Conrad, oh, I don't have much time left. I don't have any food. I don't have any ammunition. My troops are tired. When are you going to come and help us? Uh, or, or should we give up? Conrad is going to look at this and say, oh, that's going to be very, very, very bad for military prestige if, if this uh, big fortress and 100,000 people go into captivity. So he's going to do whatever he can to relieve the fortress. And that's going to result in what is commonly known as the Carpathian Window War last from January to April 1915. Now this is going to be three offensives that Conrad is going to launch in winter in horrible conditions across the uh, Carpathian passes at Chemis. They're going to do one by the third army in, in January to February, another by the second army and the German and a German army called the Sud Army, the South Army in, um, in, in uh, February into March. And then they're going to want to do one last half half attempt uh, when the situation is already too too impossible to ever reach this this besieged um, fortress. All of them are going to fail. It is complete debacle on the on the hands of the Austrians, and much of it is to do with also with Conrad's insistence on carrying out offensives at the worst possible time in some of the harshest uh, weather. Uh, of the year in one of the most isolated and inhospitable regions of all of, 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 uh, of Europe. There is no roads, there is nothing except just snow-covered wooden, um, wooden uh, mountain. Uh, and the, the uh, general in charge, Conrad, is going to just keep saying that poor weather shouldn't be an obstacle. Now, as you can probably see here, I've put in a bunch of quotes, and as you can see, weather is very much an obstacle in these campaigns. There's gonna be minus 20, 25 degrees 
uh, soldier is going to freeze to death. In one night, one regiment loses 2,500 uh, 2, soldiers. In one night, they all freeze to death. Um, the, in, in the night, the wolves, a lot of packs of wolves will feast on, on sleeping soldiers, on the wounded. Uh, we, you have entire regiments going off. You have in, in, in a single day in this campaign, 50,000 austrian Hungarian soldiers will be lost completely. They're just missing, reported as missing. Some of them are, are going to be um, prisoners of war. Some of them are going to be dead. Some of them, we will never know what happened to them. They're just lost in this complete uh, inhospitable mountain pass. Um, and nothing is going to come of it. The Austrians cannot push above the, uh, the summits. They can take the summits at times, but then counterattacks will throw, throw them back in. And there is, it is not possible for them to make any significant attacks at all. And um, in the end, the, uh, the fortress of Presemifel runs out of hope. There is absolutely no food left. There's no chance of doing anything. They're going to do one last breakout attempt uh in in the last day they uh, oh sorry in the middle of march and then they're gonna give it up now unfortunately the whole uh the 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 you know the the, the last major uh point to really show how terrible this operation is is that the last offensive of the austrian gangs the last attacks happen to relieve Prochemisl after the fortress has already surrendered. But the, the army commanders in the field are not given this information. And they launch an attack to relieve a fortress that has already fallen. About 100,000 people are going to go into captivity. Many, many generals, uh, lots of guns, a lot of uh, is going to be made of this in the Russian propaganda. It's a huge victory. Uh, and the, the casualty figures of this whole campaign, the Carpathian window, is astounding. As you can see, in from January to April, the Austro-Hungarian casualties run into 800,000 um, soldiers lost. Now, the Russians, because they are running so many counter-offensives uh, to try and stem the, um, the Austrians, and in April, they're also going to launch their own offensive to try and push the Austrians back onto the uh, Hungarian plains. Are going to lose a lot of troops as well. 1.2 uh, million soldiers in these four months. That is two million soldiers. <laughs> Quick math. Uh, yeah, but uh, but as you, as you probably know, this, these these casualties are much larger than than what you see pretty much anywhere else in the war. This is more than twice what what, uh, what both sides lost together at Verdun in the twice the, the time period. It is, it is more than, than the Don and the Somme put together. The, this is just one immense catastrophe. Most of these casualties are not going to be the result of actual combat, but are the result of weather and prisoners of war. But it's going to be uh, devastating for both sides. The Austro-Hungarians will never recover from this. They are already out uh, about uh, a million men from 1914, and then they add 800,000 to that in the first four months of 1915. The Russians are also going to be crippled as well. And this uh, makes an opportunity for the Central Powers, despite heavy losses, because they are going to look at, at the front, and they're going to see that the Russians are very much uh, beaten, but the Austrians are also on the brink of defeat. So you have these four men here. You have uh, in the top left, you have Ivanov, who is the uh, Russian commander of the Southwestern Front. He has a very big problem because he has no more troops to man the, tr uh, the trenches. Then you have the man on the, uh, below him, Conrad, who is on the brink of collapse. And he's saying to, the, to his German allies that I will not be able to do anything much more longer. Uh, we are completely spent. Then you have. Um, Hindenburg and Ludendorff in the bottom right, and they're going to say that, oh, something has to happen if, if the um, Austrians won't collapse. And they're going to go to their new boss, who is taking over from Molke in 1914, Eric von Falkenhayn, in the top right corner, and say, you have to focus on the east, because otherwise we're going to be out our most important ally, 
and we are going to lose this war in the East completely. The Austrians are going to collapse. We are done for. We cannot hold them ourselves. Um, and they're going to say that you have, we have to have the troops to launch an offensive now while the Russians are weak from the battles in Galicia. And if we look at the front at this point, this is the, uh, the front the, as it looks uh, following the, the Carpathian uh, Winter War in April 1915. You can already see that there is a lot of German troops involved on the, on the uh, Eastern Front at this point. At this point in the war, there are more central power troops in the East than there are in the West. Uh, and you can see that the, the Germans are manning the top, and then you have the Austrians in the, in, in, in the bottom, in the south, southern part, uh, shorn, uh, supported by a few uh, German armies as well. Uh, but it is a massive engagement all of a sudden in the east for something that was not going to happen until after France was beaten out of the war in the west. Now, you also have a lot of Russian troops here. Uh, you have a lot of armies engaged. But the most important part of this front at this point is right here at the third army, uh, the Russian third army there um, is very hard hit from the, uh, the fighting in the Carpathians. And this is where there is an opportunity for the central powers. They are going to launch an offensive there and try to break through the Russian lines with the fourth and the eleventh, the fourth Austrian army and the eleventh German army, and see if they can punch through the weak third army, uh, the weak third uh, Russian army there uh, between the towns of Gorlice and Tarnov. Now, to to lead this, you have another happy marriage. Uh, you have Mackensen, who did not perform very well at Tannenberg but who has learned his lesson from that and has proven himself in the fighting in the, the fall and the winter of 1914. There is a discussion of who's the best general in the, of uh, the best German general of the war. My vote would probably go to, to, to Mackensen. He is a very good commander. Um, and then I've put, as you can see, Mackensen, and I know it, it doesn't look like it, the people person, because one of the most important traits of Mackensen is that he is very, very good and very, very diplomatic when it comes to working with the Austrians, something that the German generalship generally lacks. They are very, very uh, harsh when it comes to describing their allies. They are not treat, uh, very diplomatic. They're happy to just give commands and expect that something happens. He is much more diplomatic. It means he's the perfect man to, um, to lead a combined offensive in the East. He's the perfect man for the job because he is, in fact, despite his looks, a very uh, diplomatic person and a, a people person who works well with everyone involved. He's also liked by Conrad, which is not uh, something you hear often when it comes to Conrad and the Germans. Uh, and he is going to enforce this idea of the Mackensen wedge, or the Mackensen phalanx, which is a short, fierce bombardment and then just pour uh, troops through a, a, a hole in the front and just keep going. And he's going to make use of all the latest technology. Aircraft, he is a big fan of the telephone. Uh, that is going to be a very important weapon for him to the point where his soldiers have the uh, authority to shoot anybody who's seen standing next to a telephone pole behind his front because he's worried that, that, that there is sabotage of the phone lines and then he can't respond. He wants to know everything that happens in front of him all the time. Uh, and he's going to, to make good use of his, um, his uh, um, uh, chief, of, chief of staff, who is the guy on the right, Hans von Sick. Uh, this is the later photo of him, but it was the, the best one I could find. Uh, and there is a saying that where Mackensen is, Sick is, and where Sick is, victory is in the German army. He is very capable as well, and they're going to ver work together very well in many, many battles in the future. Uh, Sick is also going to go on to be his own, uh, yeah, to, to command his own forces in, in, in the future, but they're going to make a great pair. Now, so what happens is this uh, offensive of Golitsa Tarnov begins you know, on the 1st of May. I've written out a lot of things because a lot of things is going to happen. We can't go through this in, 
in detail, so you, you have to follow. But basically what happens is that the Germans spent the 1st of May uh, uh, zeroing their guns on the Russian positions, harassing them. Uh, they've spent a lot of time with, with the Air Force to map out the, the Russian positions. And then on the 2nd of May at 6 in the morning, they're opening up a very, very hard, uh, uh, fierce bombardment of the um, Russian Third Army's lines. Um, and they, they're making use of the best of the German guns, best of the Austrian guns, heavy, heavy guns, uh, more than 30 centimeter mortars, uh, be, all the biggest guns they have, and a lot of them uh, at the same time. And then four hours later, they're going to push through with the infantry and it, it completely breaks the, the, the already broken Russian army, third army, and they managed to advance 10 kilometers the first day. Um, 3rd May, they, um, they have uh, captured 12,000 enemies. The, the uh, Russians are beginning to withdraw from the Carpathians, uh, and it just goes on. 5th May, all the lines of the, the Russian 3rd Army are broken through, and there seems to be no way of stopping the German and Austrian uh, offensive here. As you can see, um, by the 6th of May, 60,000 uh, Russians captured. And by the 9th of May, all of Mackinson's objectives of the, that, that they have planned have been taken, and 3rd Army is almost completely destroyed. Now, uh, Mackinson will, will meet with the uh, Allies and his own chiefs. Um, sorry, just a little light, now it's getting dark. Um, he's going to meet with them, and they agree to push on with the offensive, just because now the Russians are on the run, we're just going to push through uh, as much as we can, as fast as we can. They're going to cross, uh, they're going to set the, the new offense, uh, uh, the new uh, objective at the Sand River, where, which is the river that uh, Shemis lies on the, the, the fortress, uh, and already on the, um, the 17th, they've crossed this river, uh, and on the 31st of May, the German artillery are bombarding the Russians now inside Chemis. 3rd of June, Chemis is recaptured, and another conference is held. They agree to go on again. And they're saying that now we want to take Lemberg, which is the uh, capital of Galicia lost in September 1914. <clears throat> yes, so the, uh, from the 13th to the 17th of June, the Germans and Austrians advance another 29 kilometers. If you're familiar with the Western Front, you know that this is, this is unheard of there. This is insane uh, advances that they are making over enormous um, distances. And it's much to do with Mackinson's insistence of knowing where his troops is, keeping in contact with the, the troops in the, in the front, and always keeping up the pressure, not giving the Russians a chance to recover anywhere. So on the 19th uh, to 21st of June, a new attack sends the Russians into a headlong retreat and the, uh, the um, uh, Supreme Commander of the, uh, of the Russian army, Grand Duke Nikolai, he orders Galicia completely evacuated. And uh, the following day on the 22nd of June, Lemberg is recaptured and this marks the end of the Gorlitzer Tunnel Offensive. Now, very short because we're running out of time, a lot of the things that will happen now is that the Russians are going to start to fight amongst themselves, um, especially in the general staff. They are pulling back and they're going to blame everything on everything. But most of all, they're going to say that they don't have the shells possible to do anything. The shell shortage of 1915 is going to be a massive issue in Russia. Now, there's a lot of discussion amongst historians now. Most of it... Um, as had been done by Norman Stone in the 70s, who, who started to say that, oh, the cell shortage wasn't really a deal. The problem here was really bad management on behalf of the Russian soldier, uh, on the, of the Russian generals, not getting this, the shells to the actual front, but having them stack up behind the front where they were of no use. Um, and uh, and he's, he's saying that the shell shortage becomes this thing this scapegoat that Russian commanders can blame the defeats of, of 1915 on again and again and again without looking at the actual issues. Um, and it, it, it's, it's going to be a continuous thing. 
Now we can return to this if, if, if we, we need to, but I just wanted to mention it. So with uh, Gorlitz and Tarnow done, the, um, the, the, the Germans and Austrian meet again. They, then at the, on the 23rd of June 6th, Magnuson's chief of staff, uh, proposes that they continue the operations into Poland, into the Polish area towards the town, of, uh, the uh, city of Brest-Litovsk, and in the north, over Ost, which is this, this uh, part of the, the front uh, that commanded by, by Hindenburg and Ludendorff, is also going to join in with an offensive of now into Lithuania. On the 24th, Tsar uh, Nikolai is informed that Poland cannot be defended and that the Russians will have to pull back to a new line. But you can see the new Russian line of defense, uh, which will run for, from Kovno to, to Grodno, Brest-Litovsk, and down to the, to the um, uh, uh, Dniester River and, and the Buk in the south, all the way down to Chernovitz in on the border with Romania. Uh, and on the 13th of July, Oba Ust launched their new offensive, and they are also going to do well to begin with. Again, you have the same results. Russians are not able to stop Mackensen. They're going to push on 15th of July. Mackensen begins his new offensive after some time of, uh, of uh, regrouping, and they're going to push the Russians back 14 kilometers. Germans reach the Nara River in the north, and they capture uh, Adam. They, they, they push on. You, you have, uh, they cross the Nara, they cross Vistula, they capture Lublin. Which uh, the, the Russians were uh, the Austrians were stopped short of in, in Galicia in, se in September. Uh, the previous year they're going to take Kolm. Warsaw falls on the 5th of August. Uh, the fortress of no Novogiorgiev is uh, besieged in in uh, on the 10th of August. You have another um, line here. 17th of August, Kolmno is taken. Novogiorgiev is taken a few days later. The fortress of Osoviet, which we will go back to in the next lecture, uh, is captured, and Stavka, which is the Russian high command, moves its headquarters uh, from the town of Baranovich to Mogilev. And um, on the 26th, Brestitovsk is captured. We'll hear more about Brestitovsk. And then Conrad begins what is known as the Black and Yellow Offensive, we'll get back to in a minute. Uh, as you can see, Continues more and more and more and more um, cities are captured. This is what is known as the Great Retreat for Russia. And you can see that by the end, on the 19th of September, the Russians have been pushed back very, very far into Russia. And they, by the end of the year, the Russians will have lost 1 million to 1.5 million men since the beginning of this uh, offensive. It's a massive blow. The Germans are only going to lose, uh, the Germans and Austria are only going to lose a couple of hundred thousands. It is a complete victory. Um, but as we can discuss in the discussion, uh, was it that important? Was it that decisive? We'll get to that in a minute. But by this point in, the, uh, in September, the, the Germans have outrun their supply lines. Russians are able to actually hold them. And bad weather, winter weather will begin to set in to the offensive cannot be continued at this point. Then we have, just because it is an important uh, part of this, in the end, as I mentioned, this black and yellow offensive is an Austrian offensive only. They also want, as the Germans are pouring into Poland, are pouring into Lithuania, they want to have a piece of the action. And Conrad is very happy, uh, sorry, very uh, uh, keen on having his own victory separate from the Germans. So he's going to launch a black and yellow offensive named after the colors of the House of Habsburg. It's going to be a grand offensive to take uh, the towns of Rovno um, and, and in an attempt to, to separate the uh, northeastern and the south, southeastern front completely, cut some rail lines, but it completely fails. The Austrians don't have power to, 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 to do this. They have lost too much. They can't handle an operation on this size on their own. As you can see here, even their own commanders start to say that this is a shameful operation. They cannot do anything. They lose a quarter of a million men in a couple of, of, of weeks. Uh, and amongst the staff, or it's Conrad's own staff, they will call it the Herbstsau, Conrad's Herbstsau, which is basically translated to the autumn swinery, or, or, or more, more correctly, maybe to the autumn fucker. Uh, and it is not going to be a very, very um, 
proud moment in Austrian history, and it's going to be completely buried after the war by Austrian uh, historians, the ones in charge of the the uh, the, um, the state archives and the war archives. They're going to completely cover up this terrible uh, operation. Now, another important thing that happens because of the uh, the uh, the uh, Russian uh, defeat. And the 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 goal is the tunnel offensive and the, uh, the continuation is that by the uh, by September, uh, Tsar Nikolai is going to take command of the army. He's going to sack uh, his uncle, the Grand Duke, and send him off to the uh, to the um, Caucasian front, uh, where he's going to do actually quite well. And he's going to take over command by himself. This will have enormous consequences, but that is for the next time. I just want to mention that it happens here, and then another. Thing that happens is that the German focus turns to the West again. German focus turns from the after having been on the East for most of 1915. This is where they want to see if they can knock out the, the, the Russians and then turn their attentions on the France again. Uh, Falkenhayn says that the East gives nothing back. You can punch and you can punch and you can punch and you can punch. But in the end, you're just halfway to nowhere. You just you you cannot get it, anything done. You can go on and on and on, but you're never going to be able to reach the end of Russia and uh, be able to accomplish anything. So he's going to say, "We're done. This is it. Now I'm going to go back to the the West." And then he's going to start planning for the Battle of Verdun uh, in the beginning of 1916. And that is the end of part one. Uh, and we will return to the beginning of 1916 in a week. Nikolai, take a breath. Well done. Brilliant. Well done, mate. Absolutely brilliant. And need I say, not even, it was basically delivered in a foreign language as well. So well done. <laughs>